guns.com here. Today we've got kind of a special little treat that's different from most of our other gun videos. Um, if you recognize this one, and you should, it's a Browning High Power, but it's not really a Browning High Power. It's actually an FEG clone. They started making them in Hungary in the 1970s. This particular one somehow found its way into uh, Israel, and so it has a couple of weird quirks. Now, we've done Browning High Power reviews uh, in the past. The gun has been around for a very long time. Uh, so I'm going to link in the article uh, one of the really nice ones that runs through different variations. Uh, it's kind of an ode to, you know, Browning's final uh, contribution. is one of his final designs, really. Unfortunately, he did not live to see it manufactured. Um, he was working on it in the 1920s, and in the 1930s, uh, they finally started producing them. And it served on both sides of World War II. Uh, it still serves some places today. Uh, up until recently, uh, U.S. allies were using it in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, but to return to this one, the reason that it's special, and you can see that it's clear, but the reason that this one is kind of unique is mostly visibly you can see it's had a rough life. You know, you can see cosmetically um, that this gun has gone through a pretty rough life. Um, that makes sense. It's a little bit hard to trace some of the history and facts and all that stuff for FEG clones. Um, they were imported, well this one in particular was imported to Israel, but then it was imported into the U.S. They came in different waves. This one most likely served with the Israeli police. Um, that seems to be pretty typical of some of these FEG high powers. Um, one of the more interesting things is if you look down here, you can see a pretty crude and aggressive cut into what are already very worn uh, grip panels uh, where they attached a lanyard loop that did not come originally with the gun, to the best of my knowledge, and definitely looking at uh, the fact that they had to basically just gouge a square out of that and press in a uh, lanyard loop. If you're looking at the, I hesitate to even call it patina, uh, in some places this is just plain old rough uh, wear. Uh, the bluing has worn off, and it's gone through a, a pretty heavily used life as well. You can see the grip panels are worn. There's pretty much no grip left, uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, but the gun still shoots. It still chugs along. As you can probably tell based on the good condition of these magazines and the pretty rough condition of the gun itself. These are not the original magazines. These are actually Metgar magazines. Uh, interestingly, the Browning was originally designed to be 13 plus 1. Uh, these Metgar mags nah, put you up to 15 plus 1, which is in keeping with a trend that we're seeing really with modern self-defense pistols and duty pistols today as well, uh, although those are going up in, in numbers as well. Other than the mags, um, which are Metgar mags and in Great condition, work wonderfully. Um, this gun also, if you notice, there's a small hole in the trigger, and a lot of people, what they like to do is that allows you to pull out the magazine safety inside the gun. That can also change the trigger. Um, I don't do that. I don't generally modify my guns internally if I can avoid it, especially if it's an older piece, because um, I'm normally owning something like this because I find it interesting. Uh, this one was worn enough where you could not see the front sight very well. It was basically just a shiny object, so it does have a little bit of paint on there uh, that is easily removable. You can see they're very basic combat sights. Um, but uh, returning to the trigger, the trigger is around 4.8 pounds. You could add a new trigger spring to it, and you could probably get it to be more aggressive in its reset. Brownings aren't really known for being... Uh, aggressive resetters, uh, or having great triggers in general. They're functional duty guns. There's nothing wrong with the triggers. Um, but if you're used to shooting something that kind of proactively resets the trigger for you, and I've caught myself doing this, you might short stroke the trigger uh, and, and skip the reset. So one thing that was pretty common, and still is pretty common with uh, used high-powered pistols, is uh, they came with a magazine disconnect, and a lot of people don't like that. I totally understand why you would not want a magazine disconnect. And so they would go inside and they would remove that. That might have some impact on the trigger. It could also potentially use a replacement trigger spring. Um, it is old, and it, as you can see, it, 
It looks like it's been dragged through the desert in a wet holster and then left out in the sun for the better part of the 80s. So, um, yeah, but uh, that could be a thing that if you're gonna get a used high power, paying attention to whether or not it has the magazine disconnect, and if anybody did anything inside of it that's a little bit wonky is probably worth uh, your time, especially if you want something that's pretty much mint. This is the opposite of mint. Um, it's one of the reasons I love it. Um, I'm not sure how well you can see it here, but we'll get some close-ups on it, and that is just how worn the grip panel is. Um, I do have hog grips that I'll put on this uh, when I shoot it, mostly because it, it just flops around in my hand with absolutely no traction. Um, you can even see that the bluing is completely gone um, on the back strap. The, the bluing up front here is not only completely gone, but it has developed some, uh, I hesitate to call that patina. It's more tarnish. So at the range, it shoots well. It's low recoiling. It's a two pound, pretty much all steel pistol. Um, once you put on new grips, it's a lot more enjoyable to shoot and you can tell the difference pretty much immediately. It does actually have some slide wobble, which is probably from the normal wear and tear that it has gone through. Although, um, you know, was it necessarily designed to be a perfectly fit gun? It's meant to work every time you pull the trigger. It pretty much always does, as high powers are generally known to do. And even with that slide wobble and these very crude sights, uh, at 10 yards, you're still more than capable of putting it in the black within two inch groups. I'm not an expert high power shooter, um, but they do still show up as comp competition guns. Um, now, so overall, uh, this gun might be worn. I really, really like it. There is one thing on it that I don't like, um, and that is the safety which the safety can be used to hold the slide back so that you can disassemble the gun. But it's also obviously a single action only pistol. So the safety is required if you're gonna carry it locked and cocked. And this safety is not only not very tactile, it's actually stiff and almost feels like it's dragging on the gun, um, but you kinda can't hear it very well either. So it's positive enough that I've never really accidentally uh, deactivated it on the range, but it's not the kind of safety that I would rely on for my self-defense gun. Because I can totally see trying to do a downward stroke on the safety and missing that. Again, to me, this is more of a fascinating piece of history and interesting ownership. It was not well maintained. Uh, I do oil it, and I will be honest, sometimes there's like a little bit of shame when you see a gun like this, and you're like, that one's mine. Because everybody on the range thinks that, that you did that. You're doing something wrong, right? But you know, it's still an interesting little gun. I found the FEG um, high power. I couldn't really tell much in the way of differences between this one and the actual FN Browning. Although, you know, your mileage might vary, especially as you see one of these surplus ones that have been rode hard and put up wet arrive at like a gun shop. I'm not sure this would move very well at a gun shop, although right now with the shortage, maybe. Uh, it does have a push button up here, magazine release. Uh, there were some guns, not this high power in particular, uh, but there were a lot of European guns at the time that had a heel release. Americans don't generally like that. I find them to be okay uh, if you're not trying to do speed reloads. But with the new Mechgar mags, you know, they, they come in, but they don't like spit back out. So speed reloads really aren't probably your goal. Uh, we were able to run this gun pretty quickly. Um, 15 rounds in a couple of seconds and a couple of hiccups over the life of this gun only when I've been trying to shoot it as fast as I can. Um, specifically two failure to reset the triggers. Uh, that very well again could have been me on the range, uh, just short stroking the trigger, but equally it might just have a worn trigger spring, which luckily there are plenty of leftover parts and new parts that you can get if you want to replace that. I probably won't. This gun doesn't leave my safe more than a couple times a year. And even at that, it's mostly uh, just for plinking. So one of the reasons I like this high power, even though it's not an FN high power and it has been put through the ringer, um, it, it's reliable. I did not have a high power of my own. And in 2017, FN stopped making the Browning high power there's still plenty of used ones out there, many in a lot better condition than this buddy. Uh, but the fact that you can find them used, and I like a little bit of wear and tear on my guns, I like to see that they've lived a life. 
I also like the fact that it's a testament to just how robust the design was. And that, on top of the fact that guns in this condition come at a different price point, you know, it was an easy choice to add to the safe for me. If you like old guns like this and you like this video, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and subscribe to the channel. We're going to have a lot of great gun content, including more used guns, coming to you down the road.